If you got a Bible, would you open up to Genesis chapter 5? And while you're turning there, uh, I'll kind of bring you up to speed. We are continuing our series entitled Friend of God, but we're actually kind of starting a mini-series within the series since this series seems like it's going to go over a year. Okay? And some people are like, are you being serious? Are you really going to preach on Friend of God for a whole year? And here's my response. No, I'm going to do it for the rest of my life. So it, it, here's the deal. I, I never thought I would do something like this, but, but if the Lord said, I will bless you talking about being best friends with me, I'm going to drive a Mack truck through that for as long as he'll let me. Okay? So I was getting ready. I, I, you know, I kind of have the, the essence of the book laid out. I've had the, the table of contents for years. And when we got to this part, uh, we're going to talk about that this mini-series is entitled what are God's friends like? So we spent a couple weeks talking about what is God like, but if you really want to learn how to become a friend of God, wisdom would say, study God's friends. In fact, here's the way I would say it. God's friends teach us how to be God's friend. And so when we got to this part, here was my plan. I was going to do four friends of God in the Old Testament, and I was going to take two a week, so two weeks over the Old Testament friends. Then I was going to take four friends from the New Testament and do two over, you know, each week for two weeks. So we were going to do four weeks, eight friends. The first two friends, Noah and Abraham, as I was preparing for this message this week, and then yesterday morning, uh, you know how when the Lord just moves in on you and he just hijacks all your plans? Anybody ever experienced that before? I go into the weekend thinking, Noah and Abraham, I've practiced the message, we good. And then about between six and nearly eight yesterday morning in my time with the Lord, he just started dropping bombs on Noah. And, and I was like, I, I can't in 22 minutes talk about Noah and then do Abraham for the other half of the message whom you called your friend. Like, this is not fair. And I felt like the Lord goes, then why try? I was like, so, so I'm going to take eight weeks to talk about your eight friends? And I feel like the Lord goes, duh. <laughs> so we're going to talk about Noah, just Noah today. And we're going to slow roll our way through some of God's friends so that we can learn how to be God's friend. And Noah teaches us so much about being friends with God. I'm going to give you four things. Here's the first thing that Noah's friendship with God teaches us about friendship with God. Point number one, friendship with God can be a family thing. Genesis chapter 5, starting in verse 21. When Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. After the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived in close fellowship with God for another 300 years. That's a pretty awesome statement right there. Enoch walked in close fellowship with God for 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived 365 years, walking in close fellowship with God. Same exact words. Then one day he disappeared because God took him. God was so in love with his best friend, he was like, I can't wait for you to die. Come be by my side. <laughs> this is crazy to me. And this is in Noah's bloodline. Look in verse 28 now. When Lamech was 182 years old, he became the father of a son. He named his son Noah. For he said, now he's saying this to God. He names his son, but he's talking to God via the name. May he... Noah, bring us relief from our work in the painful labor of farming this ground that the Lord has cursed. So he acknowledges the Lord, and he asks the Lord to use his son to break the curse. Okay, so this is Noah's bloodline. Intimate fellowship with God can be a family thing. Now, for me and my family, it was passed down to me. My great-grandmother was an absolute soul-winning savage. The woman had no fear. She gave Moish Rosen, who founded Jews for Jesus, his first New Testament. The woman knew no fear. 
She won more people to Jesus because she was so in love with him. Then my grandfather and grandmother, they were in ministry for over five decades. He was a senior pastor. Then my dad was a worship pastor. I've told you before, he would sit outside my bedroom when I was a teenager at the piano before he'd lead the whole church in worship. He'd lead himself into the presence of the Lord for several hours on Saturday mornings. This, it was passed on to me. It didn't start with me. It was passed on to me. Timothy was in the same boat. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Paul says, I remember your genuine faith, for you shared the faith that first filled your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. And I know that same faith, the one they had, I know that same faith continues strong in you. They passed it on to him. One of the greatest things a human can leave to their children their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren is a rich spiritual inheritance. Now, some of you, and I'm doing this on purpose, I kind of talked about myself a little bit and my family, then I talked about Timothy and his family after talking about Noah and his family, and some of you might be wrestling a little bit, going, well, I didn't grow up with that. I didn't get that. That's not fair. So Preston, are you saying that intimate fellowship with God only comes if it's passed down through your family. I am absolutely not saying that. Because let me show you the other side of that coin. Intimate fellowship with God does not have to be a family thing. Now, we're going to talk about Abraham next week, but I want to bring him into this conversation. To know God intimately is absolutely possible for any child of God even for one who grew up in a family which did not even know God. Ready for me to show you? I don't want to get too, too far ahead, but Abraham in Isaiah 41, God calls Abraham his friend. Think about this. He did not say this of just anybody. Very few did he go on record and make any kind of a statement, this is my friend. But Abraham, he literally said, my friend, he said something similar about Moses. Do you know Abraham's family background? It wasn't anything like Noah's. Let me show you. Joshua chapter 24, verse 2. Joshua said to the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worship other gods. One of God's best friends grew up in a family that worshiped other gods, not even believing in God. It doesn't matter what kind of family you grew up with, whether you had a good model of intimate fellowship with God or no model. You don't need a family playbook to be intimate with God. You need the family playbook. It's his book. So don't use that as an excuse. Because Abraham grew up with a daddy who worshiped idols. God isn't measuring how much your parents or family tree love him in order to have friendship with you. He's measuring his love for you, not their love for him. Your friendship with God is far more impacted by your love for God than by your family's love or lack thereof. Friendship with God can be a family thing. Let me say this. If you didn't grow up with a family who passed you a rich spiritual inheritance, let me issue one of life's greatest challenges. Start it with you. Start it with you. Even if I wouldn't have had it passed to me, you know what burns in my heart? I want my great-grandchildren, if I get to see them live even for a moment and rock them before God takes me to his side, I want to speak life and intimate fellowship with God over them. I want them to see it every time I walk into the room. I want them to feel that he walks in with me. I'm going to pass it on to those who come after me because it's the only thing in my life that matters. And you don't need someone to show you how to do it in order to give it. We've got a book full of models. And that's why we're spending two months together. 
studying just a few of them. Here's the second thing. Noah teaches us about friendship with God. God's friends enjoy God's pleasure. If you're in Genesis 5, look now in Genesis 6. And we're skipping a couple of verses I'm going to come back to. Because originally, point number two was actually point number three. Point number three was point number four. And point number four was actually point number two. But the Lord started messing things up. So now point number two is point number four. And that's how we're closing this message. So I'm skipping a few verses, but we'll come back to them. Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 says, But Noah, hit the pause button, because the, the verse is right before this, describe how evil the earth was, how bad everything was. Then there's a huge but in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. But even though all of that was totally evil, Noah found favor. Love those words together. He found favor favor with the Lord. Noah found favor with God because God was looking for a friend he could give his favor to. Favor in the Hebrew is the word chen. Let's all practice our Hebrew today. Spit on your neighbor and say chen. Way to go, peeps. This word chen is our word for favor, but buried in this meaning is also the way to find it. Yes, it means favor, but it also means pleased with. Helping us understand, when God is pleased with us, we experience God's favor. This is going to stretch some of you theologically, because I know some of us lean a little bit further in the opposite direction of this. It's all Jesus, and we're going to talk about this. But never forget, when the Lord is pleased with you, it always affects what happens with you. Let's go to probably the most famous verse in the entire Bible, talking about pleasure and God publicly declaring he was pleased with someone. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. Jesus coming up out of the waters of baptism. Scripture says, and suddenly, as Jesus comes up, a voice came from heaven, it was the voice of the Father, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, I've heard this taught over the years in a way I believe is a little incorrect theologically. I've heard some people say, well, this proves that no work is required for God to be pleased because Jesus had not even performed his first miracle yet, and the father was saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Okay, I don't mean to crash anybody's party, but I actually think that's wrong. Let me help you understand why. Jesus' public ministry to man on the earth started with his first miracle. But Jesus' private ministry to the father started when he left heaven and came to earth. He was pleased because of what Jesus had been doing the three decades leading up to his baptism. It wasn't that Jesus was doing nothing, and I'm about to show it to you because if you're mad at me theologically right now saying, no, 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 Preston, it's not about what I do, it's about Jesus. Let me just show you, all right? Luke 2, 52, talking about Jesus as a young boy in the middle of his father's process. It says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus increased in favor. The favor grew. God does not play favorites, but he does give varying measures of his favor. If there weren't varying measures of God's favor, you wouldn't be able to increase in it. Some of us just have this idea theologically that God is pleased with all of his children equally. I don't believe that. I don't believe scripture bears that out. Because if that were true, how could Jesus grow in favor? If there was only one measure of favor, there isn't. That's why he grew in it. Preston, God isn't pleased because of the things I do. God is pleased because I'm in Christ Jesus. Totally agree. Romans 8.8, 8, it's impossible to please God when we're in the flesh. Totally get what you're saying, but I don't think that's all of it. 
It's a both and situation. Yes, he's pleased with me because I am found in Christ, but he's also pleased when I live like Christ. We can't please God apart from Jesus, and I understand that. But I do not believe that all believers are equally pleasing to God. Let's go further, because I'm just in a teaching mode. Hebrews 11:6. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Question, are there varying levels of faith? Yes or no? Now, all the people in this room, do we all have the same measure of faith? Okay, if there are varying levels of faith and it's impossible to please God without faith, does it stand to reason that there are varying measures of his pleasure? If he responds to my faith, it appears, according to Hebrews 11, that it is in a commensurate manner with the faith I am walking by. Let me say this, just a little personal side note based on this verse and the two verses I'm about to read you in Hebrews 10, verses 37 and 38. Yet a little while, and the coming one, speaking of Jesus, will come and not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. Speaking of us, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. I need you to understand something about me in this season of my life. I am more committed than I ever have been in my life to walking by faith in a manner I never have before. And it isn't so we could build something. It's so that we can please someone. When my daddy tells me, son, you want to know what brings a smile to my face? When I drop you into a desert and nobody thinks what I put on your heart to do can be done. Want to know what brings a smile to my face? When you are crazy enough to stand in that room and say, my God reigns and he will do what he wants to do and no one will stop him. You want to know what brings a smile to my face, son? When I ask you to do things that scare you, but you look in my direction and say, my daddy holds up the universe with one word. He can pull it off. Let me apply this to you. Give you a little preview of possible coming attractions. Later this year, it's entirely possible that we have our first miracle offering in like eight years and our first capital campaign in the history of our church. And there's a chance that the God of the universe might ask you to do something that scares you to death. Well, Preston, economic times are getting worse and worse. Mm -hmm. Want to know the sweetest time to give a gift? When it's inconvenient. But only those who walk by faith do it. And I just need all of us to get a picture because my family's going to be in the same boat. We can already feel it. We're already starting to line our ducks up in a row. He's going to ask for something that scares us all. It's how the church started. It's how Pillar's starting. And here's the picture. Our daddy is looking our direction to see if we'll do it in fear or do it by faith. And I think anything we do by faith, believing in our great God, I think he kind of watches it like this. <laughs> the movie's about to get good now. Everybody else saying it can't happen. Everybody else says this is the worst time since 2008 to try and pull it off. But you crazy people actually think I'm capable of this? Watch what I do. I just need, a, not me, him. I just need a group of people who will actually put their lives in such a place where they walk by faith, not by sight. Watch how I move among them. And it's not just us, it's all over the earth. I believe we're about to see an unbridled move of God. And it's going to come through. The church with clean hands, a pure heart, vibrant faith, and dripping intimacy. To me, this is the key to the end game. This is the beauty of the bride in action. But we got to walk by faith 
to pull it off. And we see with Noah. Noah found favor with God. We actually see with all of God's friends. He responds to their faith. Here's the third thing we see in Noah's friendship with God. And if you're already mad at me after point number two, let's just stay in that posture and get to point number three. God's bar is excruciatingly high for his friends. I'm not going to sweet talk you. I've told you this before. It's part of the crux of the series and the book. Not every child of God chooses to be friends with God. God, in my opinion, does not decide which of his children will become his friends. His children make that decision. That's good news for all of us. He's not looking at you going, I'm sorry, you don't have the bloodline to be my friend. You know what he does? We're going to talk about this in communion. He looks at you, and if you're a child of God, he literally says, oh, you covered in the blood? You got access if you want it. How close do you want to be? I sent my son to tear the veil. How close to me do you want to be? Friendship with God, though, is excruciatingly expensive. Two areas where God sets a very high bar for his friends. First, righteousness. Genesis 6, verse 9. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time. Strong words. And in fact, this is the first time in Scripture the word righteous is used. And God goes on record using that word to describe his friend. The Hebrew word for righteous is tzaddik. It means innocent, upright, and devout. But I want to show you why God expects righteousness from his closest friends. Because sin is not a religious problem. Sin is a relational problem. Look in verse 9, Genesis 6, the rest of the, the sentence and Noah walked in close fellowship with God. Same words describing his great-grandfather, Enoch. How was Noah able to walk in close fellowship with God? The first part of the verse tells us he was a righteous man. See, some of us consistently say, well, my righteousness is as filthy rags. Absolutely theologically true in comparison to Christ Jesus, righteous acts. But that does not mean any or all of my righteous acts are worthless. It cannot be used as an excuse to not even try to live a righteous life. God is constantly trying to pull us closer to himself, but sin is our act of pulling away from him. What separates man from God grieves the heart of God. But when man draws nearer to God, it overwhelms the heart of God. Let me show you now, kind of illustrate the relational problem sin creates. I want you to pretend like there's a doorway right here. And on that door is the word intimacy. And then over here is another door. And on this door is the word iniquity willfully choosing sin. Intimacy, iniquity. And I want you to notice these two doors are in the opposite direction of one another. When I face the door of intimacy and walk through it, my back is turned on iniquity. I am too busy with him to be caught up in that. But notice, when I am faced this way, walking through the door of iniquity. I'll move further and further away relationally from him. We all have a choice. Intimacy or iniquity. Behind this door, Satan overpromises all kinds of things. Preston, if you'll just answer the knock at the door and walk through that door, that hole in your heart will be filled. That thing you're looking for to get from others, I'll make sure you get over here. 
He absolutely overpromises. Behind this door, the God of the universe isn't overpromising and shouting. He's whispering, saying, Come away with me. Have you ever thought about the why behind God never overpromising? When people overpromise to you, it's always a red flag for me. Here's why if you feel you have to overpromise, odds are you will always under deliver. But when he does not overpromise, want to know why? It's impossible for him to overpromise because he always overdelivers. So he's not saying, Preston, if you just walk through this door, I'll do this, 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 and this. I'll give you this. No, 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 no. He's not trying to buy my love. He's trying to woo my heart. This fool over here is trying to promise me all kinds of things my flesh wants. But notice my flesh and his spirit are at war with one another, moving in the opposite direction of one another. I can't have it both ways, intimacy and iniquity. Close fellowship with God is a matter of removing the things which create distance between you and God. Small compromises can lead to huge relational chasms, not because God walked away, but because we turned away. Sin is the choice not to do something God's way. Let me say it another way. Sin is choosing the opposite direction of God's. The secret place has a price of admission. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Only those with clean hands and a pure heart. That's the portrait of a righteous life. Here's the second high bar God sets for his friends. Obedience. Obedience. In the midst of God painting this picture and giving Noah the instructions of how to build the ark, how to fill the ark, when to get in the boat, we see two sentences that I think are extremely important to understanding friendship with God. Genesis 6, so Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. Genesis 7, verse 5, so Noah did everything as the Lord commanded him. One of the things Noah teaches us about friendship with God is that intimacy with God is impossible without obedience to God. I got a lot of people going, I want to be best friends with God. And then when he lays out the price of admission to be best friends, Jesus did it in John 15, 14. What did he say? You are my friends if you do what? What I command. And some of us are like, that doesn't sound like a friend. That sounds like a boss. Well, let me help you understand a sweeter way to understand obedience. I learned it when I got married. Life works better when you do what you're asked. <laughs> let me lightly illustrate this. When we first got married, and the first time in our little apartment that Holly said, hey, babe, will you do the dishes, please? You know I try and roll very transparently. I'm not proud of how I responded. My response was hideous. And I, I didn't jump on her, but in my heart, I was all over it. What? Do the dishes. Such a little chauvinistic pig. What? Do the dishes. Fine, I'll do the dishes. And I went into our, our little kitchen, and I was slamming every dish so that they made noise she could hear in our back bedroom. Okay, here's what I learned doing what she asked me to do, but with the wrong heart. I got no credit for doing it. She did not care that I did the dishes because I did it with an impure heart. As I've gotten older, I have learned that when I do what she asks me to do, from time to time, there's a reward. <laughs> now I try and keep it pure in my heart. That's why I've hidden God's word in there. But he said, let the wife of my youth, I'm not going to finish the rest of that verse. <laughs> when I do what she asks me to do, another way to say it, when I obey. <laughs> when I obey, I see her response. 
God went on record in Deuteronomy and said, when you obey, let me tell you my response. Life just works better when we do what we're asked to do. Jesus said, Preston, it's impossible for us to be friends if when I ask you to do things, you refuse to do them. So when you show up to work, and by my Holy Spirit, on the way to work, I say, hey, there's going to be somebody that you bump into at the coffee machine this morning who's in a rough spot. I would like to encourage them through you. Please give them this word from me. Preston, it's hard for us to be friends. If when I ask you to do those things, your response is, that sounds crazy, no way. That's like me when Holly says, can you do the dishes? No, that sounds crazy. That's your job. Some of you are flinching. I just said it on purpose. Here's why. Because when the Holy Spirit moves on us to share a word with somebody and we say no, what we're saying is, that's your job. So you should flinch even more than when you flinch me saying to my wife, no, that's your job. Because some of y'all actually winced. I wonder how often the Holy Spirit winces when we shut him down. How can we be best friends if the number one word he hears from our hearts is the word no? This is what obedience is. Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. Here's point number four. And this is my favorite one. Fourth thing Noah shows us about friendship with God is really, really good news. It's that God is looking for friends. If you're in Genesis 6, look back in verse 5. I love this, and I've never, I hadn't seen it until this week. The Lord observed, the NLT says, the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything, not just a bunch of things, God saw in his observation of the whole earth that everything on the earth was evil except Noah. He saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. True or false, God knows everything which will happen before it ever happens. Let me brag on our God just a little bit more. True or false? God knew everything that would happen before anything ever happened. True. So if God knew every single thing that was happening, why did he observe every single thing? Because think about it. If you were God and you knew everything that would happen before it ever happened, would you pay attention to everything that happened? Don't act all righteous and say you would. No, because to you, there'd be some things that seem like not that big of a deal that you would turn your back on. If you think about everything going on at the earth, on the earth right now, you wouldn't observe everything if you already knew how the Hallmark movie ended. Why? If God knew everything that was happening before it ever happened, why was God so intently observing everything that was happening? I believe it's because God wasn't watching. It's because he was looking. Here's a very important part of your theology, and I'm going to frame it in the form of a question. Do you see God as one who is watching everything or one who is looking for someone? Jesus came as a friend to die for friends because the Father sent the Son to bring him friends. Every child of God can be a friend of God, and this is what I believe God was looking for. He wasn't watching all of the sin, even though he sees it all, but he already knew it all. I don't believe he was watching. I believe he was looking. He was looking for someone, a friend. I'll show it to you, verse 6. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them, all of the evil people. And he was sorry that he ever put them on the earth. Watch this next part. It broke his heart. What broke God's heart? The fact that everyone was sinning? 
or the fact that he searched the whole earth and can only find one friend? I think it's both, but I certainly believe it's the latter. Of course his heart was broken by all of the sin. And why was it broken over the sin? Because sin creates relational separation between man and God. Why was his heart broken? Because he scoured the whole earth and could only find one friend. God is always looking for friends. The extent to which God is looking for friends to me is revealed in the extent to which his heart was broken when he only found one. Which means the other side of that coin. If his heart is shattered when he can only find one, as it relates to that one, I believe his heart explodes every time he finds a best friend in one of his children. I don't want to set, settle for being a follower. I want to be a friend. And I don't want to just be a friend. I want to be one of his best friends. God is always looking for friends. 